Hello everyone, uh, once again I'm Dr. Heather Hatch and welcome to the Museum of Ontario Archaeology's Live Talks. Uh, today we're going to be talking about underwater archaeology. Uh, so, um, again, again, I do, I am here in my home studio, so I have my, my other computer set up. So if you have any questions about this whatsoever, please do ask them and I'll do my best to answer. So just to give a bit of background, my own personal uh, academic background is in sort of maritime or underwater archaeology. So I, I, I do know a little bit about what I'm talking about here, though I've never actually dived on a site myself. Um, but I have been well versed uh, and well educated in the sort of the details of what all that entails and I'll try to give you a little bit more of an idea of what that all means. So Katie and I have both talked a little bit about our uh, underwater archaeology in the past couple of weeks, uh, but we did think it was worth dedicating a longer talk. So I'll give you again, so just a more of a, a deeper dive, so to speak, into the topic. So. In some ways, when we're talking about underwater archaeology, it's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, so what we're talking about is archaeology, but underwater. So other times you, terms that you might have encountered or seen uh, around um, are nautical archaeology or maritime or marine archaeology. And so these are technically a little bit more specific. So if you're talking about nautical archaeology, it's mostly uh, archaeology that's interested in ships and shipwrecks. So maritime archaeology, on the other hand, is really more focused on human interaction with the oceans, lakes, rivers, and so forth. And this can include nautical archaeology, but it's also un interested in features that might not necessarily be underwater. Uh, so for example, port facilities, docks, slipways, and whole landscapes that can tell us about um, human relationships uh, to that environment. So this is really where my personal research um, <laughs> Um, research focus fell, so looking at sort of that, that the landscapes surrounding uh, maritime peoples and how that uh, that engagement with that landscape sort of reflected um, their, their that relationship. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so under, under, underwater archaeology though can deal with any of these kinds of specific subtopics, but also looks at sites that were um, specifically above ground but are now submerged. Uh, so before we go any Further with this, um, I do want to go back to a point that I've made in an earlier talk and talk about what makes this archaeology rather than just collecting or treasure hunting or plain old looting. So treasure hunting is something that often gets conflated with underwater archaeology, um, but archaeology is about studying past peoples ultimately. So the focus is on answering questions that we have about the past, not on just recovering interesting art artifacts or things that have monetary value. So archaeology, even underwater, focuses more carefully on the recovery and recording so that we can understand context. So artifacts on their own, as we've said many times now, uh, can only tell us, can only really give us partial answers. So we need to have that context, which is that key to a deeper understanding. And again, it's not commercial, so we're not out there to try and find things to make money. We're not looking for gold um, and we're not really looking for fame. So it's not about, you know, making yourself or making a name for yourself as a treasure hunter or an adventurer. It's really a more about that knowledge and understanding that we're looking for. So if you're hearing, you know, oh, they found this cool shipwreck and they got all this gold off of it. That's not archaeology. That's treasure hunting. Um, and that's um, something that as art, as an archaeologist is not ethically acceptable to us because you're putting that monetary value on things. You're not recording the context. You're not interested in answering those questions. You're really in there to, to get rich and to make money uh, and to make a name for yourself. And that's really kind of antithetical really to a lot of underwater archaeology. And so that is, I think, one of the key points that I would like people to take away from listening to this is that's not what archaeologists do and it's not what underwater archaeologists do. Um, so then moving on, so I'm going to get into, a, I gave you a little bit of an introduction, but I'm going to get a little deeper into some of these co um, concepts here as well. So then where can we do underwater archaeology? And the answer to that is really anywhere that there's water. So that's the oceans. That's probably what most people think about, um, you know, people diving for, for shipwrecks in the ocean, but we also have lay, um, shipwrecks and other kinds of sites also in the lakes. So there's lots of sites in the Great Lakes themselves here in Ontario, um, in the rivers as well. So we can find uh, all kinds of different uh, river associated sites. But there's other places where we have water that people might not think about people doing archaeology. Um, caves is a really interesting one. There are people who do archaeology and archaeological exploration in like really deep uh, cave waters. 
um, and then reservoirs as well, so places that maybe didn't used to be underwater but are now, uh, where there's cultural resources that are now submerged that people might be interested in learning from, we can do uh, underwater archaeology in those kinds of places as well. So really anywhere there's water, it doesn't even need to be particularly deep, then you can do archaeology underwater. Um, I have a friend who is conducting a, a project in the Florida swamps, essentially. Um, so she's doing underwater archaeology in these kinds of like swampy areas that used to be above ground and trying to, to sort of get into uh, what we can find about past peoples uh, in these places that are now inundated but weren't then. And it's really, you know, not the kind of place that you might think of people going for, certainly not a recreational diving. Um, and then how do we do archaeology underwater? So there's a lot of different approaches that people can take to finding out what lies beneath the waters. Um, and in some cases we're talking uh, about people going down and then other times there's also a lot of different technologies that we use. And there's similar technologies that we can use underwater as to as above water. Um, so if we're doing terrestrial ar uh, archaeology there's some similar kinds of technologies that we can use, but on the whole, often underwater archaeology has really been pushing the technological limits of how we do under uh, how we do archaeology period. So the, there's a lot of different technologies that are used underwater now or, or that, that have been used underwater for years, like decades even, that we're starting to see people try to figure out how to apply these on land now. And to, for me, as somebody who has the background training in underwater archaeology, it's, it's been really interesting to see people you know, starting now to think about, you know, how do we use uh, 3D scanning, for example, photogrammetry uh, to put together sites on land when in, I started grad school in about 2000, like or in the early 2000s, let's say, and there were already people working on these kinds of questions then. So, you know, about 15 years ago, um, this was already something that was being employed in nautical archaeology and maritime archaeology that we're really just starting to see get its start and get more popular um, in terrestrial archaeology. So there's a really kind of interesting technological lead when it comes to our underwater archaeology and that's partly because the environment demands it. So it's a lot more difficult to work underwater than it is above ground. So you need to make a lot more different kinds of accommodations. Um, but so if we want to talk about non-people based uh, technologies, there's sonar. So I'm sure people are sort of vaguely at least familiar with sonar. So people can use things as simple as uh, fish finders, for example, to get an idea of what might lie down there. There's also a lot more technologically advanced versions of these kinds of um, or this kind of technology of sonar devices that can be used in underwater archaeology. And I think I've mentioned this before, but really what you're doing is you're going along a track that you've set and you're looking for patterns that don't appear natural. So if you'll, you'll spot something that has a lot more ge geometric angles, for example, or that maybe it's sort of shaped like a ship a little bit, that gives you an idea that there might be something there that's worth investigating more. Um, so there's sonar, there's also magnetometry uh, that you can do underwater that's giving you these kinds of, um, these kinds of pictures of what lie down um, on the surface of uh, the, the river, or lake, or ocean. Uh, bed that you might want to go investigate further. Um, <clears throat> there's been some really interesting developments in sonar technology. There was a talk that I went to, I think, last year or the year before um, at the Ontario Archaeological Society that was talking about some of the technology that's been used on um, submerged landscapes in Lake Huron. Uh, so we know that in Lake Huron there is an area that's now underwater that used to be uh, separating really two separate lakes and that this land sort of bridge kind of area and I forget the name of it I know it's got I know it's got Apina in it but or Alpina in it but I don't remember the full name but it's got uh, it used to be a, a land crossing between these two sort of swampy lakey areas and we have archaeological evidence that people were using this area and so some of the people who are working on these projects um, out of Michigan actually are are using some really fascinating technologies where you can basically just drop like a little device and it will give you a really clear picture of what's on the lake bed in that area. And so they've been using that to sort of piece together an idea of what these landscapes that are now submerged look like. So there's all these really neat kinds of technologies that are accessible um, and from the underwater perspective and when you're trying to look into that environment. And um, again, there's these sorts of things that we're starting to see 
some equivalents of um, in terrestrial archaeology or people trying to figure out how to apply these different things today. Um, there's also uh, what we call remote operated vehicles, ROVs. So this is kind of like the underwater archaeology version of drones. And again, these have been around for a long, long time. Um, and that's partly because a lot of the technology that we see used in underwater archaeology is coming from other kinds of underwater exploration. So uh, and other industries that are using these kinds of technologies are, are or other, other industries are developing them. So if you think about like all the um, the underwater pipelines that are running, for example, there's a lot of uh, technology that have has been developed in order to um, help facilitate their construction, for example, that can then be taken by archaeologists and used in different ways and applied to, to archaeological sites as opposed to construction sites underwater. Um, there's a lot of other kinds of sciences that are interested in what lies underwater, so lots of different oceanography technology can also then be taken and applied um, by underwater archaeologists. And that's where a lot of these ROVs, remote art operated vehicles, are coming from. So there are these more um, other kinds of scientific disciplines, for example, that are interested in doing underwater exploration. And they develop basically these cool little robots that can go along the ocean floor, um, oftentimes at much deeper depths that people can go to. So I think that uh, maybe uh, an example of this kind of technology used in this in a similar context would be if we're talking about the tech, the Titanic, for example, uh, they used ROVs to explore the, the 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 wreck there because it was it was deeper than it was really safe for a lot of people to dive, um, and so we can use these things. They can they can have cameras mounted on them or even video cameras. Um, a lot of the times they have little like robot arms they can manipulate things and take samples with, um, so they can be really interested in sort of getting a picture of what's down um, at depths much deeper than people can get to and they can also uh, go into uh, places underwater that might be more unsafe for humans to be uh, in so like if you want to go inside a shipwreck it might be easier to send some sort of like remote vehicle or like little underwater drone sort of thing than to actually send a person down there who might not be able to escape i mean you might lose a very expensive piece of equipment but that's probably better definitely better than losing a human life so there's a lot of these these kinds of technologies that are accessible to well not necessarily accessible they are very expensive so they're not um they, but they're available they exist um for the use of underwater archaeology when you start talking about actually sending people into the water then it really depends on how deep you're going what kinds of technology you're going to need so some uh some kinds of sites are actually very shallow and so you might be able to get away with just snorkeling. So you'll just be able to sort of <clears throat> see what's really relatively shallowly underwater uh, with just a face mask and a pipe. Um, there's also these what we call hookah systems where there's like one big tank that's above uh, above the water and that multiple people can hook lines up to it. So you're physically attached to your air supply as you're diving. Um, but you can usually stay down longer because you have the constant air supply. Um, and then also you're not diving so deep that it's dangerous to stay down very deep. And then of course there's a technology that I think most people probably think of when you think about people diving or being in an underwater context or doing archaeology, which is uh, scuba gear. So um, self-contained underwater breathing apparatus, took me a minute. <laughs> um, and that's, you know, you're, you're carrying your own tank of, um, of oxygen usually um to to help you to breathe and you regulate your weight by wearing a, a a belt that has weights on it to help you keep down a certain depth um and these this is technology that seems pretty uh uh people are, are familiar with at least conceptually a lot of people do diving recreationally so a lot of people have taken maybe a scuba course and so forth but when uh when we're talking about archaeological work or other kinds of scientific work it's not necessarily just your sort of basic scuba orientation that we're talking about. Um, so you really have to understand the, the, the safety measures that are involved in regulating these kinds of underwater projects. So you have to, there's usually when, when you're working on an underwater project, there's usually somebody that involves diving anyway, there's usually somebody who's called a dive safety officer. And they're there to make sure that everybody is following the proper safety regulations, um, that they understand, uh, you know, that they've, they, they know how long you can be safely underwater at a particular depth, um, that you, because if you 
come back up too too quickly from being very deep underwater. It can it can cause you problems. It can give you the bends, um, which is basically the gas that's in your body. Um, if you get the, the like nitrogen gas in your body, it can expand too quickly and cause damage. Um, it's basically you need to sort of regulate the the speed at which these gases that have been under compression deep underwater um, are expanding as you come up. So you have to like have there's like charts and so forth that get into how quickly can you come up, like how long do you have to stay in a certain depth before you you can go up a little bit further. And I've I like I said I've been in these programs. I've talked to a lot of people. There's been some really interesting things that they that divers on from archaeological projects have told me that they do like oh, well, we know we're going to have this this safety stop, so I'll just bring a book, like bring like a physical book underwater that's like in a plastic bag that I can read for like five, 15 minutes while I'm waiting for to be able to come back up. Or, you know, like a little miniature, um, like the travel chess game, for example, where everything's magnetic that, that you can play with your partner to kill a little bit of time while you're waiting to be able to come back up safely from these deep dives. <clears throat> so it's really... Um, even for just the basic kind of work, it can be a, a lot of complicated technology and a lot of complicated logistics just to get this stuff done. Um, I also mentioned with your buddy, so the buddy system is also really important when you're doing this kind of work because, and again, for safety um, reasons, you don't want to have necessarily lone divers down there in case something happens. Um, so there's a lot of uh, just logistical issues. Um, that go into planning these kinds of projects that aren't necessarily the, the same kinds of logistics, <clears throat> excuse me, and can be more complicated than when you're just trying to plan an above ground um, archaeological project, which trust me, can be complicated enough as it is. Um, <clears throat> so when we're talking about doing this kind of work, so I already mentioned recording is really important. Um, how do you record information underwater? So that's, you know, something again, there's, this is, uh, technology is changing on this, but there's, there's a lot of really simple tricks you can do, like just understanding, you know, maybe you're not going to be able to take an ink pen down there and write things in ink, but there are kinds of, uh, kinds of material that you can write on, like mylar, for example, you can write on underwater with like a grease pencil, um, and that will, you know, you can still take notes down there about what you're seeing. Um, there's probably, <laughs> I'm assuming there's more uh, advanced re like recording technologies that we're getting into now. Um, there's also photography, so underwater photography and videography are very important methods of, of recording underwater. Um, they do a lot of what we call photo mosaics. So it's, it's basically taking a lot of different photographs and then piecing them together afterwards. We also get into photogrammetry, which I mentioned, which is taking those uh, multiple photographs that you're taking of a site um, and then stitching those together to make a 3D model of the site itself. Um, so there's, you know, again, there's just these different kinds of recording techniques that we see uh, used on these underwater sites uh, that might be a little bit different than just sort of taking a, t a tape measure and then, you know, measuring it. Although we also do that. So you'll also see on underwater sites where you have divers who have laid out a grid much the same way that they would do in an excavation on land, if they're uh, working on, like a, uh, working on a big like stage four sort of level excavation, you still you see that same sort of um, breakdown in terms of being able to record the location of objects and features very specifically with this sort of grid system that we get. Um, there's also some some neat kinds of um, adaptations that people have have had to use when they're working in different kinds of of environments. So there's. This is to me, this is a little bit scary, but I know people who who are really interested in doing this kind of work where we're where they're doing or calling black water dives. So the water is either really deep or it's really murky. It's just got a lot of like sand and sediment in it. So you can't even necessarily see, even if you have a light, um, what you're trying to look at or it can be difficult. So you're you're finding your way around by feel. You're taking a lot of like flash photography to get images. Um, one thing I heard about people doing in grad school that I thought was really interesting was just taking a bag down with you that's full of clear water so that you can put that in front of your face and then against whatever it is that you're trying to look at so that you have like a clear tunnel that you can see that whatever it is that you're trying to actually see underwater. So there's just some really neat sort of just different adaptations that people have had to do even in order to do just the sort of basic um, recording level of, of archaeology. And when it comes to removing things from under under 
from an underwater archaeological site. There's other different kinds of technologies to do that. And there's also the question of like, how do you actually excavate underwater? Because you can remove, you can see what's on the surface. You can remove objects from the surface. That's fine. But if there's things that are buried underwater, which does happen, um, then how do you get that up? Like, how do you actually do that? Because if you can imagine you're underwater, there's a current, you move the sand away and it just fills right back in. So how do you manage that? Well, they use a lot of sort of suction devices to do that. So there's, you can imagine there's like a, a oh, sorry, my, my dog is very excited. Okay. Um, <laughs> if you, if you have this sort of square that you're working in, where you're excavating within a grid, you can sort of like have like a little hose, almost like a vacuum hose, and you can fan the sand up into that and it will take that layer of sand away so you can sort of excavate carefully um, and see what's underneath there without disturbing things a lot uh, uh, too, too badly. And then usually at the top of that system where things are being sucked out to, they are screening them into, or it's being vacuumed into, um, into a grid system, or sorry, into a, a filter, kind of like when you're just screening dirt in the field. Um, so it's it's coming up, so your wet mud essentially is coming up through this hose and then it's getting uh, sifted through a, a grid that's going to catch any artifacts that might have been in that sand. Um, and so anything that's heavier will stay down below and you can sort of record or remove things if that's what you're doing. Um, another way that they have of re removing large artifacts is what we call lift bags. It's basically like imagine blowing up a balloon underwater. So you take the oxygen that's in your own scuba tank usually, and you can just like, if it's for a small lift, um, and you can inflate this bag underwater and attach, put things inside it, and it will gently bring things up to the surface where they can be collected um, by other members of the team. And then you've got all the records there about what things, like where things came from. Um, so that you have that, that context is preserved and then that material can be recorded um, when it gets up to the surface as well. Um, they can also do this for much larger objects. So sometimes on certain projects, people will want to like remove very large objects. For example, a whole ship. Um, sometimes people will bring that up. Um, there's also like if you find like really heavy objects like statuary, for example, uh, big like architectural elements that might you might want to bring up, you can do this with much larger lift bags and you'll sort of like create a sling that goes on like tunneling underneath whatever object is that that you're trying to bring up and attached to two different things and then sort of lift those balloons together. So it sort of brings the whole thing up in a nice cradle where it's not going to be damaged. Um, so there's that kind of technology as well. Um, and another kind of interesting technology for doing what, we, what I mean, we can still consider to be underwater archaeology because that's where the artifacts came from, is it's in some cases they've actually built what we've called a coffer dam. So um, it's basically a dam that completely surrounds whatever object it is that you're trying to investigate and you pump all the water out so that it's actually dry all around it. And then you can excavate it much more like it's, a, it's an above ground. Uh, but very usually quite wet still um, uh, excavation. So that's another technology that in some cases has been employed on these uh, submerged sites. So then what kinds of sites do we find underwater? So we've talked about this again a little bit already, but just to give you a little bit again more context here, that shipwrecks is really I think the one that people think about the most. So uh, and, and certainly that is a lot of where a lot of this work is being focused and is on shipwrecks. There's also submerged sites and landscapes. So things that used to be above water, but uh, this has changed uh, through processes like erosion, long-term environmental changes like coastline shift, or even catastrophic events like earthquakes, hurricanes, and tsunamis, um, where things have rapidly gone from being just on the coast to suddenly being submerged. Um, and then there's, again, all these man-made alterations to the landscapes, like flooding from the creation of reservoirs for dams and so and or, or the head ponds for dams um, that can create sites that were not originally submerged that are now. And this also absolutely goes the other way. So we get a lot of sites, including shipwreck sites, that used to be submerged but are now on dry land. Um, so this happens in places where the land, again, we've got just natural land growth um, over time. So we, we, if you can imagine like a beach that's growing out over time, um, also human intervention again. So places where they've tried to reclaim land, you might find a shipwreck that's now very far inland where it used to be either on the coast or just underwater. 
So we this this absolutely goes the other way, where things that used to be submerged are now above ground, or even quite high above what was an original waterline. And again, in Ontario, where we have had so much change over um, over the thousands of thousands of years of like the the glacial melt and so forth, we had the, the Great Lakes, what they look like now is not always what they have looked like in the past. And so we have a lot of different coastlines for those lakes, like where there were sites that were along the edge of um, of a lake at one point, and they're now very far inland. And again, like on Lake Huron, we have places that we know used to be above ground, but that are now submerged where we find, um, where we find uh, evidence of past peoples. <laughs> So we can also look at, um, in terms of these underwater or, or sites that we might approach from an underwater archaeological perspective, uh, again, maritime structures like dams and harbors. So we're looking at these sort of architectural features. Um, there's also uh, technological sites like fish weirs, for example, that might have been sort of submerged or semi-submerged sites, uh, but that aren't necessarily... Um, like a, a landscape or whatnot, or, or that were originally inundated and still are, uh, these sorts of fishing technologies, uh, which I personally find pretty interesting. Um, and so there's just lots of pretty much any other kind of site that you can imagine finding on land, we might find underwater. So you've probably heard of different sunken cities, for example, that's happened, um, and towns and villages um, that are now submerged. You also get cases where things that used to be above ground have sort of washed down in, like sort of through, so maybe they used to be high up above and they've just eroded um, from from being high up on a cliff face and now, cliff face, sorry, and now they have fallen down into the ocean. And so the kinds of information you're gonna be able to get from these different sites is gonna vary based on how they became submerged. So if it was a place that was submerged very quickly, um, it could be that it's actually very easy to, to understand the context of the site um, as it is. So a, a city that was very quickly submerged um, or like a campsite that was very sim quickly submerged, you might be able to get quite a lot of really good contextual information about how things still relate to each other. Whereas if you have a site that used to be above ground and was very slowly eroded by things falling down a cliff face as that became washed away or weathered away by natural actions, it might be much more difficult to say you know, how artifacts relate to each other or how they originally related to each other. So this can, uh, it, it really depends. Um, when you're talking about um, shipwreck sites, usually you've got like at least, you can at least get an idea of where, um, maybe where that ship originally was, uh, came into whatever disaster it was, like if it was, if it broke up or whatnot, usually they'll sink pretty directly, but they can drift a little bit of ways as well, depending on what the currents and so forth are like, um, depending on what the, the, also the currents like that, maybe it will stay relatively intact and you'll have a whole ship, or maybe you'll just get a huge scatter of artifacts that's been washed away by wave actions over years and years so that you don't necessarily have a, uh, the ability to say, well, this particular artifact was found in this part of the ship. So it really can be quite variable, much like in sites above ground even, um, how much contextual information um, and like site integrity is how we talk about it. Like that can vary quite a lot in these different kinds of submerged sites. But there's always gonna be something that you can say um, from these submerged sites, even if they are quite disturbed. So you'll still be able to, to be able to understand, for example, why is this site here? Um, what, you know, we, we, can, we can say a lot about these kinds of past landscapes. So even if it's quite different now, there's usually a lot of evidence like geological evidence and so forth that can give us an idea of what these landscapes used to be like. And that can help us interpret, you know, why there was a particular site here. So maybe it's underwater now, maybe like the sites that I was talking about in Lake Huron, we know that there was um, a, a ridge of land that people were using um, underwater. So there's usually still context information, even if the site itself is disturbed. So the recording is still very important, um, even if you don't think um, it is. There's always there's always something to be learned. Like even if you're looking at a shipwreck where things have been quite dispersed, um, we can look at the pattern at which things have been dispersed, and that can tell us a little bit about the the context of how things broke apart, where things might have been originally, and even um, information about the ship itself, uh, maybe about what season it was sunk in. Like all kinds of different information is is possible to to interpret the more 
context we have, same as with anything else in archaeology. Um, so the other thing I wanted to talk about today is conservation. So what happens when you take the archaeology out of the water? Um, so water, and especially salt water, can be can have a really big impact on the objects that are on, that like that have been submerged um, and that are saturated with it, especially over time. So things that were once once living have cells in them um, that were designed to hold water, things like leather, bone, wood, um, and water. Um, when they're when they are underwater, like the the they absorb. The water that's around them. So after they've died, like if, for example, if you think about a tree, if you cut it down on land, um, once it's been cut down, it will start to dry. Um, and that process doesn't really take place underwater because you have other water that's coming in to fill those cells. However, they're still starting to, it's still breaking down naturally. So the things that were keeping that that object al alive before are no longer in place, place, so it's still starting to break down. The cell walls themselves are still starting to break down, but the water from the environment is sort of holding them in, in a particular shape. When you take it out of that environment, if you're not very careful about how you do it, those cells can start to collapse very rapidly. So you can take something that looks like a solid timber underwater and bring it up um, above the surface, and it will very quickly start to fall apart if you don't know what you're doing. So. Um, if you are working on an underwater archaeological site, you have to have a really good plan about how you are going to remove archaeological objects, if that's even what you decide to do. And a lot of the cases these days, people decide not to. So a lot of the times they'll just record things where they find them, um, and then, but not make the effort um, to actually take things up because it's such a huge responsibility to look after those objects properly after you take them out of that environment. So usually with, with um, uh, or in a lot of cases, people don't want to do that. It's, a, it's very expensive, it's very difficult, and you really have to evaluate like whether or not the information you can get from those individual objects is gonna be worth it to the information and to the questions that you're trying to answer. Um, so there's other kinds of de de decay processes that, work, that happen underwater um, as well. If you can imagine metal, lots of kinds of metals don't like being underwater and they certainly don't like being brought up out of the water when they've been uh, really saturated. So iron, for example, underwater is not really the best for it, but as soon as you bring it up, it's going to start to rust quite a lot. Um, if you're talking about salt water, that's even worse. So um, salt water is full of salt crystals and as soon as salt uh, salt water starts to dry out those crystals will start to form inside of objects that have become saturated this for the, from or with this water so that applies to organic materials like i was talking about so leather wood bone those kinds of things fabrics as well anything that can really absorb the water is going to have those salt crystals in it and as it starts to dry out those crystals are going to start to put different kinds of pressure on the object but even some kinds of objects that we don't necessarily think of as being porous, like ceramics um, and even glass, can start to absorb some of these salt crystals and it can be really damaging to them if they're not carefully uh, clean. So you have to make sure you're, make, you're cleaning all the salt out of that water, so you're de oh my gosh, I can't remember the, the, the right term, but like you're taking the salt, um, desalinating, there we go, you're desalinating those objects, taking the salt crystals out of them before you let them dry at all um, so that they're not causing more damage. And so again, it's just you have to be really careful um, about removing archaeological objects from any kind of underwater context. So it really takes a lot of planning and preparation, um, even more so than we see on terrestrial or um, on most, I'll say, <laughs> on most terrestrial um, excavations. So again, there's this whole other level of technology and logistics that goes into these underwater um, projects that we don't necessarily think about or have to think about in the same way when we're dealing with terrestrial archaeology. But when it comes to what we can learn about underwater archaeology, it's pretty much the same kinds of questions that we're trying to answer. So how were people living? Uh, where were they living? How were they interacting with other people? How were they trading objects? Um, how were they traveling? So what kinds of technologies did they have? How are they linked to other communities? Um, how did these technologies spread over time and space? And then how did they, you know, 
like other kinds of archaeology, really what we're trying to get at is how did they understand and live in the world that they were in. And so these underwater contexts uh, just provide us new ways of thinking about um, other elements that, or sorry, <laughs> they provide us new um, new ways of looking at these same kinds of questions, but they also provide us a new context for thinking about how we're answering these questions at all. So if you think about travel, for example, today we think, you know, if you're trying to go from point A to point B, um, you're probably going to be driving or flying. Um, waterways and water transportation isn't something we necessarily think of. We also don't necessarily think of water as, um, a, as being important to communication. But if you think about a time before we had radio, before we had uh, telephones, before we had telegraphs even, then if you wanted to get news across the ocean, the best, fastest way to do it would be uh, via a ship. Even if you were trying to get communication between two different towns or travel between two different places, if you could go by water, chances are it would be a lot quicker than trying to take an overland route if there was uh, a water route available. And so people had to really have the kind of technology to understand what are those local waterways like? What what kinds of technology, like what shape of boat do I need in order to travel from point A to point B? Is it the same kind of shape of boat that I need if I'm going on a river as opposed to if I'm going along the coast or if I'm going across the ocean? Um, and so what kinds of technology, what kinds of ships we can see people having, um, what they're being used for? Are they, tra are they, um, are there, are they ferries for, for, um, for ha helping people travel or are they cargo ships for moving goods? Um, so there's just a lot of different kinds of questions that we can, we can look at and different kinds of relationships we can see and how people are engaging with that, that maritime environment that we can really see in these, um, underwater sites that if we're only looking at things on land, we're going to miss a lot of that picture about what's important to these to peoples of the past. And so that's another reason that I find um, underwater archaeology is really important. And it's really useful to think about, um, how, like, even in Ontario, right, we know that a lot of communities throughout the entire time that Ontario has been populated, have really been located along along the waterways. And that's true even of modern cities. Um, they're here, like they've grown out of historical um, smaller communities. Um, and they're here because those waterways have enabled transit <coughs> and communication and trade. Um, and that's always been the case. And water itself is an important resource for life. We need it to we need to, to be able to drink it. Um, <clears throat> we often need it for uh, other kinds of purposes like ag agriculture, for example. It's really important to have the, that water access. So it's just a whole element, literally, that we really don't necessarily see if we're only looking at what's on land. So it gives us a fuller, richer picture of the, the of human, like, changes human cultures and human lives um, throughout history and well back into the past. And so uh, it's a really important approach and gives us some really important perspectives. And so I hope that has been interesting. And again, if anybody has any questions now, or if you'd like to come back and leave them, leave comments on the video, somebody will come back and answer those. And I hope this has been interesting and I hope you have a great day. Thank you.